It's race week. Welcome to Unlapped, round five of the Formula One season from China is set to kick off this weekend. Nathaniel, so good to see you. I believe Lawrence Evanson and Spencer Hall held it down for the two of us last week as we were both busy. I was working. You were enjoying a nil-nil, um, really, really entertaining match somewhere in the land of England. I was indeed. I made the terrible decision to, um, on about 24 hours of being back in the UK, to go and watch my football team play, uh, which was, yeah, about two and a half, three hours uh, drive from Reading away. Um wouldn't recommend it. And yeah, they, they didn't even win. So, um, but Ipswich Town is still top of the league. So um, three, four games left uh, away from the away from the Premier League. So fingers crossed. And I know that everybody who listens to the pod will be rooting for Ipswich Town, obviously. So, um, but yeah, it was good. It was good of Lawrence and Spencer to, to jump in last week. And I think we've got big shoes to fill this week. Another two, yeah, we two person show. We really do. So you landed from Japan and then the next day you decided to do that journey? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was one of those that ambitious. when I agree with because my me and my dad go to games all the time. When I agreed with him the week before, I was like, "I'll be all right." Like I'll have had a I'll have had a day sleep, completely forgetting the entire <laughs> experience of my time as an F one journalist, which has taught me that you will not, in fact, be fine. Um, and yeah, uh, I was I was I was okay, but yeah, by by the time I got home, I was um I was in a pretty bad shattered. Shape. Yeah, are you okay now? Do you feel better? Have you been able to react? Honestly, I still feel a bit jet lagged. I think they say it takes. Uh, one day for every hour that you're changing. So Japan is okay. eight hours ahead of the UK. So this would chime. It's about eight days on since I got back now. So, um, but yeah, it's mad. The jet lag in Formula One is 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 real. It really it just lingers. So yeah, full full credit to Lawrence for not only being on this jet lag, but having been back to the UK for a handful of days and then gone back to 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 China um, to absolutely obliterate his body clock for a few more days. Now, obviously, Laz doesn't travel the way that Formula One drivers and team principals do. Now, he travels similar to a lot of the team, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, mechanics, guys working in the pit lanes, et cetera. For the drivers, I assume most go back home for a couple of days, wherever that is, in Monaco, in England, in Italy, and then they'll head back to China, obviously, getting ready for the race weekend. Yeah, and honestly, the the jet lag conversation is one that we had with them, uh, especially ahead of the Australian Grand Prix, because it's such an extreme mm -hmm. um, time zone change right before in that kind of spell that uh, it was Australia week off, then Japan week off, and now this Chinese Grand Prix. Um, and yeah, some of them some of them say they stay home for an extra day. Some of them try and come out a, a bit earlier. Fernando Alonso joked that he's not young anymore, so he has to kind of give himself a bit of extra time to adjust. I remember Nico Rosberg just said uh, years ago, he was like, um, oh, and this is one of Lawrence's anecdotes. And I stole this from him and then went on a show and said it. So I have to have to give him credit. Um, but uh, Nico Rosberg basically said before any flyaway race, he would just basically wake up an hour later or an hour earlier, depending on which way his body was going to change in okay. the week leading up to it. And then was like, I'm fine. As you alluded to there, Katie, he's also a Formula One driver waking up in a very nice house in Monaco. Exactly. With, you know, access to very, very good um exercise equipment and stuff like that so i think everybody struggles with it but yeah the the mechanics and those guys when you see them on the ground after some of these long-haul flights they they do look absolutely wrecked and then they've got to go and work very very long hours in the paddock so yeah i'm always very impressed to see that have you seen key and peel before i have i love key and peel okay. in fact i saw i forget who i forget which one is which but the taller one, the one, the one who wasn't, the one who didn't, the one who didn't direct um, Get Out and all of those films. Okay. Oh, yeah. He, I was stood at the viewing balcony overlooking the Silverstone circuit and he was stood next to me and I didn't even realize it was oh, him. Wow. And someone pointed it out afterwards. So, well, the, the only reason I bring it up is because one of my favorite uh, bits that they do is I wish I was high on pot news and it's all about joke stealing. And <laughs> you mentioned that you took Lawrence's anecdote. I always think about that. Like if I say something a little bit louder than somebody who just said it to me just quietly individually, then I'm like, oh, that was their joke. I, I didn't just steal their, that's their joke. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah, but, you've, you, but you've already there. taken all the credit for the laughter. Exactly. And everything. Yeah. Everybody's already yeah, laughed. I, think, yeah. I don't think I've seen that one. I'm going to have to Google that one after because I do yeah. like to binge Key and Peele stuff like, it's quite good. religiously. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. Type in uh, Key and Peele high on pot news or high pot news and it's, it's pretty good. Okay. I do appreciate, I've just said I'm big fans of them and I just said I didn't remember which one was which, but in the heat of this podcast, I couldn't remember which Honestly, one. Honestly, I don't remember which one is which They're either. just Key and Peel to me. Yeah, They're both Key and together. Peel. 
yeah. to go. <laughs> All right. Remember, if you're watching on YouTube, like this video, leave us a comment and don't forget to subscribe to ESPN for more F1 content. And if you're listening, please hit us with a five-star review wherever you get your podcast. It means a great deal. Okay. Let's get into this because we're back in China uh, for an F1 race for the first time since 2019. Couple of points to hit. The last time F1 was in China, Max Verstappen had five race wins. He now has 57, uh, the third most of all time. Five current drivers were not on the grid at that time. Alonso being one, Piastri, Sargent, Sonoto, and Joe Granue. So the latter, those four young guys, this will be the first time that they drive and get a taste of the Shanghai International Circuit. This is also the first sprint weekend of the season as well for a track that hasn't been on the calendar for over five years. So the sprint and lack of practice sessions, I think, should provide a lot of drama. Uh, for you, having seen, obviously, the days where we did race in China on a more frequent basis, what's the event like and how do drivers you know, and teams rank this race in comparison to others? Yeah, I love this race. And I think a lot of drivers feel very fondly about it as well. It's a really, it's a circuit that's very different to a lot of the circuits you race on uh, in Formula One. It has this huge long back straight, um, mm -hmm. which, to be honest, when that first came into Formula One was unique. Baku kind of has similar with that huge long back straight. Uh, so, well, sorry, the Baku one is actually its its main straight, but China you have this huge back straight, then a couple of little corners, and then the main straight itself, which isn't isn't small by any stretch either. And yeah, I think drivers drivers have always enjoyed the the, the challenge of the circuit. It's a weird place to go because um, you'll see. I'm not I'm not sure if they've fixed it for this year. There's a, a section of the track just before that long back straight where there's all these grandstands. They never have anyone in them. And when they first built that circuit, the grandstands basically they found as soon as anyone applied any weight to it, they started sinking into the into the like basically the marsh they've been built on. So it's not often the most mm. well attended race there. However. One of the names you mentioned that hasn't raced here before is Guan Yu Zhou, who is F1's first Chinese driver. I think F1's expecting a very, very big turnout for that fact. There's just been a documentary released about him in China as well. So I think there's a huge buzz of excitement, not just around Guan Yu Zhou being there. This was the biggest casualty in terms of races uh, uh, when COVID, um, you know, was mm -hmm. when, when the pandemic was on. Um, this race actually was what kind of kicked off. Um, for me, my my appreciation of the fact that the pandemic was going to be a big thing because in 2020, again, it's going to sound like I'm obsessed with Ipswich Town. I was coming back from an Ipswich Town game and I saw an email <laughs> saying, or, or I think may, may have been a, a message to me that um, uh, Lawrence was coming back from the Ferrari launch and he said, uh, I've heard that China's off. And I said, like, oh, what? For, for this COVID thing, as we all called it, for about a week. Um, and then and that race was cancelled and the race never your COVID was never in a good enough situation for this race to be on until this year. You know, it's always been added to the calendar with a little star next to it. And last year it dropped off. And honestly, mm -hmm. I wasn't sure we'd ever go back to China because it just seemed, you know, as, as F1 and the world was getting back to normal, China just was the big anomaly here. So it's great for this, this race to, to come back. And I think that um, in a season where we're seeing kind of a very, very one-sided season, it's nice to have something that's completely new and completely fresh. For a lot of people and even people who have seen it it's different right it's back to china so sure. yeah i think it's i think it's popular with um fans drivers from what i remember from what they were saying in japan they they like the circuit um and yeah we'll see i mean ultimately fans will decide right we'll have two chances to see races like you mentioned so you've always got two attempts to to say whether you like it or not well and think about how many new fans have joined the f1 mm. following since 2019 and have not gotten to see drivers race at the circuit. I think that'll add to the excitement because it is new for fans watching. I also think hopefully maybe it'll add some excitement from a racing standpoint because of the newness of guys not having driven it year after year after year that there's been kind of like this hiatus. And so maybe mm -hmm. that adds to um, some parody that we maybe are not expecting, which is always helpful. But I want to hit some news that broke last week and it started with um, a headline and a quote from Fernando Alonso mm -hmm. that said, I am here to stay. So he has signed a new deal with Aston Martin, tying him to the team through the 2026 season, which we know is when new regulations come into play. I'm just curious. You have a great article uh, on ESPN.com right now about Alonso's decision. You know, when Lewis Hamilton made his choice to switch from Mercedes to Ferrari the following season, I think it said a lot about what Lewis Hamilton believed Ferrari was putting together for the future, right? That he had a lot of confidence in where they were heading. 
I was curious to see what Fernando Alonso would do because you wondered how optimistic, how confident he is in this team at this point in time. I would say that he feels pretty confident with the regulation changes as well in 2026 with where this team is heading if he's willing to sign a contract extension like this. Absolutely. I think he thinks he can, you know, if not win a championship here, definitely go back to being a, a victory contender with Aston Martin. Um, you know, and there's and there's two bit there's two sides to this, you know. One of them, which you always have to kind of get out of the way with Fernando Alonso, is that his his options were limited just because, you know, one of the things that makes him such a compelling character is that he's been to a lot of other teams, he's burnt <laughs> a lot of bridges, he's you know, he's upset a lot of former teams in the past. You know, there's some teams that just won't go near him. But at the same time, you know, he's 43 right now. And mm -hmm. it's pretty unprecedented territory in, in modern Formula One for someone to be that old um, and to and to keep racing. Um, and I think that Aston Martin is just the perfect storm. You know, they they need a big name driver. They're in a similar situation. There's not, you know, Lewis has gone to Ferrari, like you mentioned. Max, as far as we understand, is tied down to 2028. I'm surprised Aston haven't kind of gone all in to try and get Max, given Lawrence Stroll's ambitions. But if you're not able to get Max and you're not able to get Lewis, the next best obvious choice is to get Fernando Alonso. Um, and I think that mutually <clears throat> this this extension makes a lot of sense. You know, Aston Martin, they're investing a huge amount in their facility, in their personnel, et cetera. They want to win a championship. 2026, they have the Honda engine coming in, which has obviously been winning championships with Red Bull. No point doing all of that if you don't have a driver who can win you those races, win you those championships. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a huge statement of intent from Fernando Alonso. And to be honest with you, it's it's similar from Aston Martin because they could have been like, well, let's go with Carlos Sainz. You know, let's give him a deal. Let's, you know, let's maybe, you know, let's maybe try and get Max Verstappen out of that contract. Um, but no, they, you know, it didn't seem, we never really heard Aston were linked to many other drivers. It seemed like they were like, if Fernando Alonso wants to keep racing, Lawrence Stroll, it seemed to be his opinion that if he wants to keep racing, he's got a contract here. So yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a huge statement of intent from him, but also from the team as well. So uh, really fascinating to see how that plays out because can you imagine if he wins a championship age 45, what a story that no. would be. It'd be unbelievable. I mean, I can't, I can't imagine it either, but <laughs> imagine might be the key word. But I mean, Aston certainly want to be in that position, right? They want to be providing Fernando Alonso with a car that can at least challenge for a championship. Right. Uh, not I, next year, but in 2026. Obviously, you mentioned some of his past decisions. Like, he's a shrewd businessman. Yeah. Like, he's going to do what's in the best interest of him, especially because, as you mentioned, his age the clock is ticking, right? If you're going to win one, again, there has to be some urgency here. And he doesn't make this decision lightly, right? And I don't think he makes the decision purely based on the money, either or the investment. So mm -hmm. he has to be confident and feel and believe in this team and Lance Stroll, Lawrence Stroll, that he can get it done. Because I feel like when the rumors started swirling that he would potentially leave to join the likes of Red Bull or Mercedes once Lewis leaves, like those actually, I think, made a lot of sense. And you'd wondered if those teams were going to try to jump at the chance because his clock is expiring. But massive news that he's going to yeah. stay with Aston Martin and, and says a lot about the team and where they're heading. I'm glad you mentioned Carlos Sainz because now the question is, well, what does this mean for him and the rest of the driver market that Alonso is now set in stone with, with Aston? Yeah. For Sainz, I think it's pretty wide open. And honestly, I feel so sorry for Carlos Sainz because given the way he's been driving, not just this season, but for, let's face it, for, you know, at least a year and a half now, you know, he's probably been, the more consistent of those two Ferrari drivers, even stretching back to this time last year, um, certainly over the last six months. And yet the options that he has left really don't look that appealing. I thought Aston was a really strong choice. You know, I spoke mm -hmm. to people close to Carlos and to Carlos himself uh, in Japan. And, you know, Aston was one of the names. They were like, yeah, we think that there's a chance there if Fernando doesn't decide to stay. Obviously that is now, is that now out. Mm -hmm. Red Bull, I think as long as Max Verstappen is there, it's just such a risky choice. I also don't see them moving away from Sergio Perez. I think that Perez is a safe option for them. You know, he they're not expecting him to win a championship. And I think Perez is now in that mindset where he thinks, I don't need to win a championship. I've just got to be quick and mm -hmm. be a good wingman to match. Compliment. You know, mm -hmm. And I think that works both ways. Again, I said about mutually beneficial for Aston and, and uh, Alonso. I think that deal is kind of mutually beneficial for Red Bull and Perez because he knows he's never going to drive a car as good as that again. You know, he's at a stage of his career where he doesn't need to really push for that. I don't think Sainz is going to go in there and accept the same thing. So I think that the only benefit for Sainz going there, and this is something I'm going to tease, and maybe this will come back to, um, you know, to benefit me in a year or two. There is a rumor in the paddock, or there is still a chatter in the paddock, that Max Verstappen might still look to get out of his contract in 2026. 
So at the beginning of that regulation change, if he believes Red Bull's engine, because I mentioned earlier, Honda's going off to Aston, Red Bull are doing their own engine for that point. If he believes the chatter that the engine is not as good, if you're Carlos signs, that is the one moment that you do want to sign a contract now with Red Bull, because let's say you sign a three-year deal, Max leaves after year one. It doesn't matter if Max obliterated you in year one. You're like, well, I'm, I've sure. been here a year. You know, I, I know the team, et cetera, et cetera. So that is in the back of his mind, I'm sure. Um, but what a gamble. Signs. Sorry? What a gamble that would be, because yeah. you don't know for sure if Max Verstappen would move on. 100%. And that's the thing. I think that's why... It is, I have to caveat it with, this is a big if. And, you know, because you could, again, Formula One, I mean, you just got to look at Max Verstappen's old teammate to see this. Formula One is so flavor of the month orientated. Yeah. One minute, you're the greatest driver in the world. The next, you're not. Daniel Ricciardo right now, everyone's like, ah, you know, what what's he doing type thing? You know, why aren't they getting rid of him? Which I think is harsh because we've seen the opposite being true, you know, in the past as well. Um I think with signs, honestly, where he's probably going to end up is for me is either Sauber, which is going to become the Audi project. Audi uh, has good links with Carlos Sainz Senior, who he still races with them in the Dakar Rally. They're going to be a factory team. They're building their own engine, etc. But they're they're inheriting a very very old infrastructure at Sauber. So that's a big mm -hmm. that's a big red flag there. The only other really good option is Mercedes, but I think Mercedes are tied to Kimi Antonelli, the youngster in Formula Two, and even if they go a different direction. Science is only ever going to be a short-term deal because Toto wants to put Kimi Antonelli in the car as soon as he can. So a lot of very, you know, half-baked options, I think, for Science, which, as I, as I mentioned, just does a really a big disservice to a guy that has been one of the best. I mean, he's the only guy to have beaten Max Verstappen not mm -hmm. driving at Red Bull since October 2022, I think. So for him to be wild. in this situation is, you know, just really harsh. Um, and I think... Um, I'm not sure if we're any closer to a decision, but I know that they wanted to be in a position where they had that deal signed before Miami. And obviously Miami is fast approaching. That's the next race after this one. So I expect we'll see some movement in the next couple of weeks. Which is kind of mind boggling because when you look at the drivers on the grid, obviously Max Verstappen has performed extremely well this season as we all anticipated, but the next best driver on the grid has been Carlos Sainz without a yeah. doubt. Comprehensively. In you would say, okay, this man is making himself a lot of money right now. And yet timing is everything, right? In terms yeah. of how the dominoes fall. And I just can't wrap my head around there not being a good landing spot for him after how he's performed thus far, especially if he's able to keep up this kind of performance on a consistent basis moving forward for the rest of the season. Yeah, and, you know, hindsight is always a beautiful thing. You look back at some of these deals that were done late last year. You know, McLaren tying Lando Norris down to a longer deal. They got Piastri tied down to beyond 2026. You feel like Zach Brown knew that this, there might be some some turmoil coming in terms of the driver market. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, you're right. Timing is such a big thing. Um, the fascinating one, and the thing that I think just really does boggle the mind so much when you think about it, because we've just completely discounted Aston now as an option. They do have a second seat, don't they, Aston Martin? They do have a second driver who, as far as I'm aware, they haven't confirmed if he's driving next year. And yet we just all assume, oh, well, Lance Stroll clearly is driving into next season. And I know why he's there. Obviously, the clue is in the surname. But for Aston Martin, it's mind-boggling to me that they limit their choices so much by just keeping Stroll. Because I think that you could have had, um, and you know, maybe maybe you don't want Alonso and Stroll on the same team. I don't know why you wouldn't. But you could have, you could have, you know, realistically said, right, we'll give Alonso two years, we'll sign signs for three. You've got, you know, one of the all-time greats in one car and you've got the informed driver in the other. It would have been such an easy solution for them. And they haven't, obviously, haven't given themselves the leeway to do that. So timing is everything. And sometimes, you know, your parenthood, <laughs> your, your your genes are everything as well. But I, yeah, I, that's the, unfortunately, that's just the reality of the grid. Because I thought Aston Martin for sure was, one of his better landing spot signs and it just hasn't it just hasn't come out. We've talked about this obviously over the last few years on this podcast. And as um great of a businessman as Lauren Stroll is, as undeniable as his competitiveness is, like at what point do you make a decision with your head over your heart, right? Or yeah. do you find a landing spot for your son and Lance on a team elsewhere, maybe not with championship aspirations per se but mm. 
I always wonder that dynamic is so fascinating. And I, Lance Stroll is a very capable driver. We understand that. I mean, there's only 20 of these guys in the world yeah. and, and he's one of them for good reason. And what he was able to accomplish at the beginning of last season after his bike accident, like that was so impressive, but I always wonder the dynamic within a team of, okay, if you say all this about how we're going to win a championship and how important this is to you, does resentment ever flicker through the ranks of those working for a shop like this when it's like, okay, if you say that, we'll put your money where your mouth is and get us yeah. a driver who's more capable to run alongside Fernando Alonso. I just wonder the power at play with with all of that and if, if Lauren Stroll will ever make a decision like that to move on from his son. I think it's a really fair question. And I don't I don't know if we'll ever see an answer because I just don't know if he'll ever he'll ever do it. You're so right as well. I mean, for me, as ambitious as I think Lawrence Stroll clearly is and clearly has mm -hmm. been, it kind of is contradicted by his driver lineup picks because every race we see this, don't we? We see Fernando Alonso just dragging that car to mm -hmm. sixth, fifth, whatever it is, fourth sometimes. Obviously, a load of podiums last year. And Stroll, I agree with you, right? I don't think Stroll by any means is a rubbish driver. You know, I, I've always said to people, I would love to see Lance Stroll in, a, in an environment where he's completely free of that comparison to his dad. You know, uh, obviously his dad was always close to him and the money was always close to him when he was mm -hmm. at um, at Williams and then um, Force India as well, which obviously has become Aston Martin. Mm -hmm. um, it would be really fascinating to see Stroll in that position where he's racing and his dad is just completely separate to it because I think ultimately that is just what the big criticism is of Stroll. It's just like, where's, is his, you know, it's his dad's team. You're n unless, you're, unless you're comprehensively beating your teammate, you're never going to, you're never going to come out of that situation looking good. Um, and yeah, I don't know about within the team. You know, I think I think Stroll is, Lance Stroll is well liked within the team. It's not like everyone's like, oh, this guy's just here for this reason. Sure. But the results are what they are, you know, and and I won't say who it was, but somebody in the paddock, somebody from a, a team jokingly said, oh, you know, a bunch of teams were fighting over the Lance Stroll point uh, on Sunday. And what he meant by that was the point that should usually be Aston Martins, that Stroll you know, this season has consistently given up. Been, yeah, he or at least he's 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 underperformed and he's opened the door for a Yuki Sonoda for mm -hmm. you know for, for Nico Hulkenberg or whoever to jump in there and take a point. Um and that just shouldn't be the case. Um so sorry, a bit of a sidetrack onto Lance Stroll, but in the context yeah. of the driver market and the situation size is in, one. it's frustrating it's frustrating that a guy that isn't really in great form is in the position that Stroll's in and a guy that's in great form is in the position that, that Sainz is in. Yeah, it's fascinating. And obviously, we'll continue to monitor it because I think it's an interesting point that you bring up to Ryan people. You know, the science camp was hoping to have a possible deal or an idea where he was going to fall in the future by Miami. And obviously, the clock is ticking there because we're a couple of weeks away from heading to the United States. We mentioned that this is the first sprint format of, of the mm -hmm. race calendar. There's been so many different iterations even since yeah. I joined the sport. So can you just... Tell us, fans, what to expect. Practice session begins on Thursday and not what we normally see. Yeah, I had to remind myself because you're right. <laughs> yeah. This has changed so many times. Um, My understanding um, is practice sessions on Thursday followed by the sprint shootout. So sprint qualifying for the sprint race. Okay. Yeah, that's, and that's right. full qualifying on Saturday. Yeah. Teams will be in Park Fermi, I think, as soon as the sprint shootout begins. But then after the sprint, teams will then be allowed to take what they've learned from the sprint race That's and adjust right. for full qualifying after the fact. I hope everybody can follow what I just said. <laughs> and I think I need to make something very clear that when I say Thursday, I mean that late Thursday for Americans here watching, whereas it would actually be Friday on the ground in China. Yes, that's and right. And I feel like I've just muddied it all. No, I mean, but it's already, this is the thing, it's already a super confusing system. Um, I know. Basically, all you got to remember is it's it's basically gone back to what it was originally, which is that you have, and this is where Formula One kind of muddled itself up last year, where you have sprint qualifying. Everything's in order now, basically. So you have sprint mm -hmm. qualifying, then you have the sprint race before you have the real qualifying, then you have the race effectively. And there's one practice session to mm -hmm. kick all that off. So if you're looking at them in order, um, and yeah, I mean, it does add a nice kind of quirk to this comeback race as well. Um, but as you've mentioned there, you've, you've seen a few iterations of this, Casey, what do you, what do you make of the sprint? Because I'm, I've still, I've got my opinions on it and I've, you know, I've tried to give it, give it time. I've not been convinced, but I th I've got a reason why I think that is, but I'm curious as to, to see what you think of them as well as someone who's come in a bit, because 
you know, it was kind of aimed at the newer generation of fan, not to not to say that's a good or a bad thing, but it was kind of aimed at kind of this groundswell of, you know, of new fans. I think if I'm remembering correctly from past iterations, I think I prefer what we're going to see this weekend because I like yes. things to be in chronological order, whereas it used to be you were qualifying for the sprint, but then you'd have qualifying for the actual rate. And then I just, I got confused. Yeah, it was a mess. So I wanted to go in consequential order. And yeah. I feel like this is what you get. And it makes it, even though, as we say it to you on the pod here, somewhat confusing, I think, to listen yeah. to and understand <laughs> as the we're struggling order, to explain it. Yeah. I think this makes the most sense in my mind of how it should run. Yeah, because last year you had, basically, you'd have qualifying for the Sunday race. Then on Saturday, you'd have qualifying for the Saturday sprint. sprint race, which made sense when you wrote it down. But when you try to explain it to people, it was just it was just bonkers. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I mean, look, it's exciting, isn't it? Having having an extra thing to talk about. The biggest issue I think that we have we're going to have with the sprint this year, um, and maybe I'm wrong because Oscar Piastri won one last year, obviously in Qatar. But I think the issue you have when there's a really dominant car is that you've effectively just doubled the amount of chances for Max to win or to take pole. Sure. You know, instead of seeing him take pole and win the race, it could go. Pole, pole. Uh, sorry, pole. Sprint race win. <laughs> pole again. Grand Prix win. You know. So I don't know. I hope that's not the case. But it's it's one of those things where this is a great format if everyone's really close. Um, and if they can kind of race each other. And we haven't really seen that over the past kind of couple of years since these new rules came in. So skeptical, but um, but yeah, I'm sure it'll be. I'm sure it'll be good fun. So you still think, even though we haven't been at this circuit since 2019. There's less practice time, less time to evaluate and kind of tinker with mm. obviously points on the line more often, right? Throughout this weekend, you still think it's going to be a, a dominant Red Bull performance, or do you think that because of the newness of the track, or I guess reacclimating to the track for some of these drivers and it being a sprint, like could add par- parity? I think I think that will make it closer than it otherwise would have been. Um, okay. You know, and I think that, you know, whenever you put Jeopardy into a Formula One race, it always helps, whether it's rain, whether it's, you know, less practice time. The issue is now these teams have such great simulators and, so, you know, the prep the prep they have for these races is so good. The other issue as well is that I think that, you know, by and large, a lot of the media coverage of this season has, has been very optimistic about the gap. People say, oh, Ferrari is much closer, et cetera. But that isn't really reflected in the gaps we've seen in the races. Ferrari is closer, yes, than it may have been at points last year, but Max has still been comfortably pole at every race. I, I, I checked this before we started, so he's he won the first race, and this is over the next non Red Bull car, which has always been a Ferrari when he's won. It was twenty five seconds, eighteen seconds, and then twenty seconds. The eighteen seconds won. There was a safety car after about eight laps, so you know, kind of bunched the field together again at the beginning, changed strategies, etc. So he's always been really comfortable. And that brake issue, obviously, was what opened the door for science. I just don't buy that there is this magical moment where Ferrari is catching. I think Ferrari has done a lot of good things to establish themselves clearly as the second best team. But I think Red Bull is just far, far down the road. And I mean, the problem with Red Bull is you throw a lot of things at them and they seem to come through them pretty well. And Max is just on a different level at the moment. So that's a really pessimistic view of, mm-hmm. of where we're at. But I think it's a realistic one. Um, and maybe I'm wrong, you know, hey, we might have two incredible races where we're like, wow, Red Bull aren't actually in the mix here. But we know how Formula One is. Things don't change that quickly overnight. You know, it might be at the end of the season, things look a little closer. But from everything we've seen so far, I just don't I just don't buy it. And um, I know Lawrence, you know, Lawrence gets into the numbers a lot more than me. Um, and I think he's a bit more confident that it is closer. But on the surface, from what I've seen, I'm fully on the other kind of the other side of the road on that but like i said i always i always clarify it by saying i hope i'm wrong well i have lawrence's podium predictions for this race and i'll tell you that uh he does not think the gap is all that close based on his picks and that might <laughs> yeah. just be i think also we're gonna be very the... similar yeah um, exactly could be the jet lag but uh he went with a pretty safe play and we'll get to that in a second but obviously you mentioned red bull and ferrari being at the top of the three teams behind those two McLaren. Aston, Mercedes, who of those three at the circuit do you feel like could get back in a position to fight for a podium? So I think this this will be an interesting test of the McLaren. There's a couple of high-speed corners. We know they've done really well in those in the mm-hmm. past. Um, but there's a lot of places where the McLaren might might slip up. You know, there's, I mentioned those long straights, et cetera. 
I think that the Mercedes McLaren battle will be fascinating. Um, those two teams have been really close, and it's such it's so difficult to get an accurate read of the Aston Martin because I feel like Fernando Alonso, as we've mentioned, is kind of overperforming in that car, and Stroll's probably underperforming in it. So you know, on merit, it probably comes out just behind where those two are. But I would, if I was betting where those guys were going to end up, I'd say McLaren, Mercedes, and Aston. Um, but okay. you know, that's doing a disservice to Fernando because I think Fernando will still finish higher than that. But pure pace wise, that's where. I think those guys are. When you look at the weekend Mercedes had in Japan, obviously they started strong on Friday, then qualifying in the race were pretty big letdowns. I think we can all agree. Do you at least foresee a better weekend, better results for Mercedes on the whole in China as compared to what we saw in Japan? I don't think so, honestly. I I I think we're a, yeah, I know. Sorry. I was trying to, I was, right. trying to I was like, do I do I do I soften this blow for Katie a little bit? <laughs> I think that honestly, at the moment, where we're at with Mercedes is they do seem to just be a bit be a bit lost. I think they're waiting for things later in the year, and I'm trying to think of the right way to say this because I don't think Lewis Hamilton has phoned it in by any stretch of the imagination. I think he's still super committed, but we've seen it before in Formula One when a driver knows he's changing teams. I think some of the intensity just goes, and I think that you know we haven't seen the same Lewis this year on track, and I think that has a huge impact. You know. I, I know people always talk about the comparisons between Lewis and George, but Lewis is still the better driver out of those two. And if he's underperforming, I just think it, you know, I just think the whole team as a, as a result, you know, suffers from that. And I don't think he's, I don't think he's out there being like, I'm not going to perform, but just mentally your intensity has to go, you know, it has to diminish a little bit. So mm -hmm. I think across the board there, um, I wouldn't be too optimistic, but that's, okay. again, that was the vibe I got from when we spoke to the drivers um, at the end of the Japanese Grand Prix, they were just like, yeah, I think it'll be similar weekend. Um, and it was a really weird one, Suzuka, wasn't it? Because it did feel like, oh wow, Mercedes again have turned this corner, and then it disappears. We seem to do like we seem to have that with them all the time, where it's like false dawn, back to reality, false dawn, back to reality. And actually, it was telling in um, in Suzuka, Lewis was very very optimistic after qualifying. I forget exactly where he qualified. I think it was eighth, but he said mm -hmm. this is the best the cars felt. He said the performance just wasn't quite there. So maybe that's you know, a sign of improvement, but just the, the car feeling good doesn't mean anything if the results aren't there. <laughs> no, absolutely. Uh, a couple other storylines. We mentioned Joe Grand Yu. It's his first ever home race for uh, a Chinese driver, which I think will be awesome to see. I, you know, you've covered many drivers in their home races, but is there a memorable one that comes to mind the first ever for a specific driver in his home country? Oh, well, that's a good question off the top of my head. Um, I can't remember any firsts that um, that I've done. I'm, probably, I'm sure there's a really oh no, actually yeah, the first one I saw that was that was huge was Max in Zandvoort. I mean Zandvoort mm -hmm. had had a race before, but it it came back, and obviously that was different because we we're in the middle of like Max fever. It was Max v Lewis, mm -hmm. 2021. That was huge, and the noise when Max won the race and when he took pole was unbelievable. I mean it was so cool. Not sure how it'll be with Joe Guan Yu. I'm not sure. You know, it's just a different fan base, a different culture, mm -hmm. but. I think, and it's obviously it's easier to support your guy when he's out in front, isn't it? Like rather than when sure. he's kind of 18th, 19th, as Joe's likely to be in that car. Um, but I think it's great because, you know, we kind of saw it in, in Suzuka with Yuki. It's great when a when a local fan base has somebody who they can kind of just connect with on a on a purely human level. Um, and it's a nice, it's a nice additional thing for China coming back with Joe. So I, I don't know how I've never been to China to cover this race. So I can't, I, I don't, I can't say what the fans are like. You always get a kind of a bit of a sense of it when you stand on the grid before a race. Mm -hmm. um, Suzuka was great because if you waved at them, when, if you're on the, if you're on the track, if you wave, they'll all wave back at you. Even, okay, if, you're, that's you know, awesome. even if you're just a journalist like me. Um, <laughs> so that was a great, like little ego stoker, you know, for, so I don't know if China's like that, but, um, but yeah, I think just adding to the whole feeling of the occasion, it's nice that they can kind of mark that comeback race with with Joe being there, um, and hopefully for him he can enjoy it because I'm not sure whether he'll get you know another season in Formula One. Um, so for him, you know, you just hope it goes at least goes cleanly. You know, he has a he stays yeah. out of trouble. He doesn't get into any crashes or anything. He's just able to kind of enjoy the moment because I'm not sure whether he'll stay with Sauber next season. Um, you know, it seems unlikely as as we stand here right now. Um, so yeah, you always hope that with a with a driver when they go to the home race, you just you're like just. Let it go okay for them at the very mm -hmm. least. Exactly. Another storyline I think that's worth just mentioning to keep an eye on is, you know, Yuki Tsunoda continues to look strong for the start of the season, whereas his counterpart, Daniel Ricciardo, um, I'd say is looking for life at, at this point. 
Um, he's obviously going to want to impress to make sure that he can secure a seat for next year, which is not a given at this point. Um, with the 2025 seasons kicking off in Melbourne. So keep that in mind. But mm. the dynamic between those two, do you foresee something clicking for Ricardo here soon? Or do you think we're going to see much more of the same? I hope so. You know, I, I, we always joke on this pod, like I've tw- people on Twitter have called me like the, the president of Rick Nation, all this stuff, because I've always covered his career quite closely. Um, mm-hmm. I think there was some optimism to take from um, from Japan. Ricardo seemed a bit closer on one lap pace to Yuki. Um, obviously had that crash at the beginning of the race. Mm-hmm. So we didn't really get to see what happened there. Um, but I think there's been so many rumors about that situation and RB going a different direction. Every single person I've spoken to have kind of downplayed that and said that's not the case. You know, Ricardo's not been given an ultimatum to improve. That will that may well come later in the year if he doesn't turn things around. But I think honestly, I think that the Yuki situation there is actually a godsend for Red Bull because Ricardo knows he's got to raise his game to that level. If he doesn't, then Yuki mm-hmm. looks fantastic as he as he is doing at the moment. You know, if, if they do have to get rid of Ricardo at the end of the year, they've got Lawson waiting in the wings. I don't have a sense that they're desperate to promote Lawson into that seat. Um, so I don't know. It's a difficult one. But it's 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 one of those things, isn't it? I think Ricardo probably gets a harder rap and an easier rap as well at the same time. When things are going well, yeah. it goes it's easier for him because he's so popular. But when it goes difficult for him, people there's a bigger pile on. And I think that, that, that that's the case with any popular athlete you know we maybe give them an easier time of things we're, we're, we're quicker to praise them when things are going great and it goes sure. the other way and he's he's seeing that you know at the moment but um i actually think for what it's worth i think yuki we mentioned signs earlier i think if you were to say who have been the three best drivers this year you know p- you know purely if you were to make a podium of the best performers you put max science i think sonoda would be right there as well given what Good. he's doing and the car he's got you it's know fair. fernando would probably be right there kind of trying to push yuki off the podium maybe um, but I think Yuki Yuki would be would be there as well. So he's doing so well. Not Checo because he's in a car that allows him to be that good. Yeah, and I think Checo's had a much better season. Uh, sure. you know, honestly, he's he's. But I think just given the context of the car and the fact that you know mm-hmm. he isn't beating Max, whereas you know Yuki's comprehensively beating Ricardo, he's he's scoring really important points for that team. Um, I'd probably put him in there. But yeah, though Checo has been much better. It wasn't meant to be a knock on on Checo or anything like that. Checo's at least in like the top five or top 10 this year, which last year was not the case. He was struggling to, you know, even be a, even kind of be a top tier, like looking driver last year. So he's, yeah, he's, he's, he's turned that around big time. I'll give you an opportunity to stand for Checo. If you so choose with podium predictions, everyone picked up a point by predicting max in last race (laughs) in Suzuka. That's an easy point now. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, it's a boring pick, but it is uh tried and true at this point. Last still leads after four rounds. He's got six points. I am in second with four points. Nathaniel, you are in third, which is last in case you could not deduce <laughs> at three points. So last <laughs> sent in Savage. these predictions Yeah, from Shanghai since he's on the ground. He's predicting Max, Checo, then Charles Leclerc. No. So selfishly i want to go next but i'm gonna allow you to make your picks i mean you can go next if you want i don't want to i don't wanna upset i don't wanna upset the you know the rhythm of the game well i was thinking I'm... similar as as lawrence okay as Tom, he's... Lay, lay it on me and as he's leading i feel like i'm wondering do i go riskier than him or do i play it safe i'm always going to play it safe with number one go max okay um i'm going to put Charles Leclerc second and then checko third let's say Let's say Ferrari get in there. I'm not sure they can, but the one thing with Perez is occasionally he opens the door like he doesn't qualify in the right place. Mm-hmm. Hasn't happened so much this year, but it did happen in Australia. And obviously that's when when then when Max had issues, it was Ferrari who were right there and so Checo. So maybe we'll see that again. I'm going to do the same thing as you, but I'm just going to flip the Ferrari drivers. So I'm going to start nice. Max Verstappen to win, Carlos signs to finish P2, and then Checo to round out the podium at P three i don't know if our gamble is going to work in our favor no, but we might have just is. cost ourselves two points each um okay. <laughs> just just for the sake of keeping the pod interesting but hey that's part of the game it's part of the game it is probably and if actually i don't like that he gets to choose for like since he's in first he should have to choose last yeah but because True. he's obviously sleeping i think it's like midnight at this point in shanghai so we had to get it in yes believe so but yeah no but 
you science is a good pick from you. I think that it's Nothing. It's the sensible pick. I don't know why. I don't know what the logic with me. My 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 feeling is Shaw. It feels like he needs one of those bounce back performances. Mm -hmm. um, he just got himself a puppy as well, so he's going to be I all loved up. Leo. Yeah. It looked yeah, like Leo. a golden retriever, did it not? Or maybe a lab. And of all of the puppies, of all the types of dog for Charles Leclerc to get, what a perfect dog for Charles Leclerc. I look like the the energy of is it was it a golden retriever or a Labrador? I think, I think it, it was good. I think it was a gold. I think it was a gold retriever. retriever. But either way, they're like just the energetic, kind of happy, slightly, slightly goofy kind of, kind of dogs. You know, everyone, everyone's favorite dog, basically. I'm checking. Stand by. I know everybody's on pins and needles, wanting to know exactly what it is. Baby Leo. So we got the name right. I don't know. That might be a lab. You know what? Send a message to Laz. They haven't had media, have they, quite yet? We need these are the Not hard yet, no. hit questions. We need to know what kind of breed this dog is. Yeah, I'll 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 send that to Lawrence ASAP, and we'll have it for the next show. What type of dog it's is Leo? Dog. Uh, maybe it is golden retriever. I don't know if you know yeah, if you're a so. an internet fiend or a Charles Leclerc super fan. <laughs> just hit us in the chat. Let us know what kind of dog it is. Roscoe and Leo content next year. Oh, yeah, maybe that's why he's done it. Maybe that's why he's done it. He's looked and said, "I can't, oh. I can't be out outmatched by a good call, a Zach. Yeah, good call. Too much cuteness as always. Hey, thanks. Get some sleep. I hope you're able to finally like get into a good rhythm before you head to the United States to go to Miami for Le Tub. Le Tub, the best place on earth. If the, anyone from Le Tub is listening, Miami, <laughs> best place in Miami without a doubt. It is a hole in the wall. As always, thank you so much for listening, for watching. Katie, George, Nate Saunders, we appreciate you greatly. Enjoy the Chinese Grand Prix. We'll be back next week for more unlapped content. Cheers.